who is Mingyang Lu from Rice University, who's going to talk about the robustness of gene regulatory circuits. Yeah, first, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity. Uh, by the way, I just recently moved to the Jackson Laboratory as a new assistant professor, only for three, three months. Um, so my research is mainly on gene network modeling. Uh, so what we do basically is typically use the bottom-up approach to study the dynamic behavior of gene network circuit motifs. So here shows the pipelines of our modeling approach. So what we do usually is to start from the biological functions we, we're interested in. Then we try to construct a gene networks by using literature studies or the database, such as ingenuity pathway analysis. Uh, we are particularly interested in the transcriptional regulatory networks. Um, we can use computational modeling methods, such as deterministic analysis or stochastic analysis, to predict the gene expression dynamics of the network. The prediction will be validated by the experiment data, and this can also help us to refine the network. So I would point out that the quality of the experimental data is very essential. If we consider some bulk expression, for example, if we have two genes with intermediate expressions, there are two possibilities at single cell level. They can either all the cells are in the intermediate, or it's possible to be a mixture of subpopulations with two totally different gene expressions. So I, I think um, single cell data will really help us to do the modeling. But on the other hand, uh, if the model really worked, and this can really give us um, mechanistic pictures of the, of the gene network, and this can eventually help us to understand the gene expression from the single cell data. And, and uh, another thing is uh, we can, this can really help us to look at another new directions to look at the data. So however, this type of traditional model analysis may have several issues. Um, the key assumptions here is that the core circuit motifs can uh, capture the, the major information of, of a big gene networks. However, the, there are a lot of questions, uh, I think, for most of the systems biology approach. So for example, how do we know, how to choose the number of genes? And, and even if we know this answer, these genes are now in isolation, so they are connected with many other components. How, how do we consider the effects of the other genes? And many people study the motifs, but however, a typical motifs couple with other motifs. When they couple together, they may, may fun, not function the same way anymore. Um, and and then another problem is many of the network information may, may have some missing components. And the most typical problem is that the connected parameters uh, for the regulations, which are required for the modeling approach, are usually not directly measurable from the experiment directly, especially uh, for the in vivo data. So how can we deal with this problem? So um, now I would like to introduce the new methods that we recently developed to address several of the questions highlighted here. The method is called random surface perturbation, or recipe. So here, based on the assumption that a big network can be decomposed into two parts, Similar to the bottom-up approach, we think there should be a core, which determine the major functions. And the rest of the genes we consider as the peripheral genes. And the function of the peripheral genes is to add some redundancy to the core and to make the core more robust. And meanwhile, they can modulate the signaling states of the core as well. So if we believe this scale separation, then we can still focus on modeling on the core and meanwhile, consider the effects of the other gene as a random perturbations to all the connected parameters to, to the core. So in recipe, we generate ensemble models, each one with very different set of parameters. We do have a specialized uh, randomization schemes to, to make sure we randomize the parameters properly. So we, for each of the parameters, we randomize them by an order, a two order magnitude of difference. It's like, 10 times or 100 times. So that's a very big difference. And meanwhile, in the ensemble, we make sure that these parameters 
can capture the topology information of the, of the circuits. So then for each model, then we can use traditional methods to do the modeling. Um, for systems, typically we're interested in systems that can give us some steady state gene expressions. So we can utilize the methods to calculate the gene expression patterns. So here, for the ensemble models, we have the parameters and we also have these gene expression patterns predicted from our model. So then we can do the statistical analysis on all of this data to find out some robust features that are not specific to a certain parameter. So what I would point out that we're definitely not the first one to sample parameters. But here, we, we think as an ensemble, every model is useful. We're not just uh, fit to a specific parameter, uh, I mean, fit to a specific experiment. But here, we think of different models and capture different status of the circuits, for example, different signaling states, epigenetic states, or even the mutation states in the, in the case of cancer. Then, then we uniquely apply some biostatistic tools to all the models and to understand the behavior. So here, uh, we tested the recipe to some very simple circuits. For each case, we generate a lot of models. And here it shows the probability distribution for different features, for example, monostable, bistable, or tri-stability. But that's convenient. But what really surprised us a lot is the following. So if we put all the gene expression patterns from different models all together, here's a face plane showing the level of A and B. We found they form clusters. So remember, in the model, we, we randomize the parameters by a lot. But still, we can see very clear clusters for different cases. And it, it tells us that probably we can just need input uh, topology. And they utilize these recipe methods to unbiasedly give us this, to, this stable state information. So, so the purpose of methods, of course, is to really apply that to a very much bigger system, such as the circuits here. Here is the stem cell circuits that we partially learn from the literature. And we also improve the circuits a little bit by incorporating some new interactions. Here, each of the interactions is validated by the experiment, and there are transcription regulations. So we, it's highly connected. By looking at that, we don't know what's going on at all. So we simply apply recipe on that. We can identify some robust gene clusters. Here shows the PCA without all the origin expression patterns. And the probability of each of the states is shown in this pie diagram. Another innovative way to look at the data is to plot this heat, heat map. Here, each of the line is a gene expression pattern from, from one model, and each of the color is a gene. So it looks like very similar to the gene expression data. So we can pretend ourselves as experimentalists and, and then apply existing biostatistical tools to do the analysis. For example, hierarchical clustering analysis. We are, so we identify some clusters, which is consistent with what we see from the PCA. Then we compare with the single cell data. Uh, this is embryo data for different stages from Dr. Borgwood and also Paropsin. So we found some major clusters matched to the experimental data, but only to the latest stage of the development, but not the early stage. That may suggest that the circuits only work for the later stage, which makes sense. And, 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 uh, and we found majority of the robust gene clusters are identified from the experiment. Only one is missing, but even for that one, we found some experimental evidences of the existence of these states. So they tell us that uh, very similar to, to the ideas that people use in the bridge design and the protein folding, um, if we know the topology information, and presumably we can predict the dynamics it seems like the topology determines the functions and the, fun and the dynamics for proteins and the bridge. And here we want to argue that it is the topology of the circuits that determines its dynamics, not, not the specific parameters. So we can do a lot of analysis by using this recipe framework. For example, here, here we can do the perturbations, and, and we can do the simulation of knockdown by setting the gene expression to be very low for each gene, then generate ensemble or models by using recipe again. Then we can compare the original recipe ensembles with the new ensemble to see the difference. 
the bigger the difference, the meaning the, the more important the gene might be. So we do that for the gene and also for the links. Here, the, all the results are summarized in this diagram. The bigger the circle, the thicker the line, the more important the components are. So we, we find that the most important components are the SOX2, OF4, and the CDX2. So if we put these components to one layer, and we can find the hierarchical structure, and each layer corresponds to one decision-making module. So now it's much clearer what's going on here. So lastly, I want to show one example of the decision-making circuits for epithelial methanchymal transition. Here, this system contains 24 genes. That's the largest system we try. And the, the recipe can handle this very nicely. So we found four clusters, the epithelial states, methanchymal states, and the two hybriding intermediate hybrid states. And here shows the heat map and also the PCA. And the hybrid states have been validated from the single cell uh, imaging analysis from our collaborator, Dr. Sanham Nash from MD Anderson Cancer Center. So here, all the cells, they have both expression of the mentin and the But I, I, I don't want to go into the details, but what we found from our simulation is that for the forward transitions, it seems the cell goes through the first intermediate, and the backward transition will go through the second one. So it seems to suggest that, that the, here is a universal transition path for these cell transitions for EMT and MET, and which is quite different from what it proposed previously of the sequential uh, switches. So this model haven't been uh, tested, validated yet by the experiment data, but we are working on this. So to conclude, here we propose a computational methods for the recipe. The only input we need is a topology. And from that, we can use recipe to generate ensemble models and unbiasedly identify the robust gene clusters. And we can also use the methods to find out the functions of the circuits. So I think by integrating the single cell data, the recipe can really be a good method to bridge the bottom-up systems biology approach and with the top-down genomics approach. So finally, I would like to thank people from my personal lab, the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics. Jodai is my mentor. I have two graduate students currently visiting my lab, and, and uh, I'll have a postdoc very soon, early next year, and there are openings available. And for undergraduate students, you're welcome to apply these two programs. Thank you. Questions? Okay, why don't I start then? So, you, you use the analogy of proteins, and presumably proteins then folded to form complexes and coming together to form complexes. That's a problem that's still not solved. Um, um, and I wonder, and despite having a lot of information, so I wonder how reliable this is going to be and how robust is the approach to, in particular, to the topology being wrong? because one of the challenges is getting the arrows in the right place. And do you think, how, how robust is it to errors there? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, um, in terms of protein, um, what we really tried before is uh, to start from the folding structure. Once it's folded, um, the motion highly depends on its shape. So, so, so previously, I did mention is that we previously studied um, methods called the normal mode analysis which is based on the native structure. And, and uh, the, the basically, the normal analysis is for very well to capture the lowest frequency collective motions and, and it just by capturing the shape information. And, and the work pretty good. And in terms of team network, we utilize a very similar approach. As long as the topology is correct, we think we can get a very nice result. But if the topology is wrong, we may have some trouble. We haven't tested this yet. So one thing we can try is to start with from a very reliable network and to randomly put a based on interactions, see how it works. But, but my, my, my thoughts is, uh, the, if we don't have a lot of um, connections, uh, the network is too small, maybe there's a susceptible to these um, errors. But once they, they become much larger to a certain level, then then even you have some errors in the network, they may not be very important anymore because the circuits, um, because of evolution, they make sure that the network is robust to a certain level. 
Okay, there's a question here. Yeah. So uh, just uh, simple questions. Uh, so you are showing uh, you showed the kind of the basin structures, but I I assume the whole thing is simulation result is just a probability density, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So basically, for your EMT and ET is basically still dynamic. You can go from anywhere, jump to any places. Oh, uh, so far in our modeling approach, we haven't incorporated the stochastic analysis yet. So basically, for each of the steady states we found, we we don't know the probability. But eventually, we will incorporate the stochastic analysis here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we have some probability, but um, I would just say that if we incorporate the stochastic analysis, we might be able to get the probability much accurate. Okay, if there are no further questions, then let's thank Ming Yang again. And it's a pleasure to introduce our final speaker.